Our focus today is on Israel's ground offensive on Gaza. The death toll among Palestinians has gone above 8,000. Uh, and the onslaught continues. We look at what's happening on the ground, uh, whatever information we have thus far. Uh, we also ask what the diplomatic community is doing and what will be the fate of the United Nations resolution, the latest resolution uh, on the subject, wh whether it will gain any momentum, carry any weight, and what sort of impact it will have on the lives of the over two, uh, two and a half million people in Gaza, as well as those, of course, in the other occupied territories. Uh, we're also focusing on uh, elections in Taiwan. Uh, 2024, there's going to be a spate of major elections that will uh, determine how some of uh, world politics goes. Of course, India is having an election. Uh, the United States is having a major election. And in Taiwan as well. Uh, now, the opposition parties are talking about coming together in a coalition. Uh, we asked what this might mean for a potential flashpoint between the United States and China, the two biggest economies in the world. Uh, and finally, there's a study out that shows how much private spending on healthcare in the United Kingdom has gone up and what kind of impact that has on the National Health Service. Uh, now, we will try to understand uh, the dynamics between private spending on healthcare and how uh, that works out and the kind of pressures it puts and exacerbates on a public system. Salams, as always, you're watching Daily Debrief, brought to you by People's Dispatch. Before we go any further, take a second. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Right. We've been consistently uh, overshooting our time here on Daily Debrief. Our top story, as it has been pretty much consistently since the 7th of October, is uh, Israel's uh, onslaught on Gaza after Hamas launched Operation Al-Aqsa Flood. Uh, and so I'm going to bring Abdul in right at this point to give us the latest updates uh, on what's been going on, what's what he's been hearing. Uh, of course, the ground offensive, Abdul, is the main talking point um, and battles already happening on the outskirts of Gaza City. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, in fact, uh, there are reports and uh, claims and counterclaims made by both the Israeli forces and the Palestinian resistance forces that the tanks, uh, uh, a large number, of course, uh, went inside the Gaza uh, territory. They basically were about to reach Gaza, Gaza City, where there was a huge uh, battle which ultimately led to, as the claims made by the Palestinian assistance, uh, the kind of withdrawal of those tanks again. So, uh, and this, of course, has led to uh, some uh, civilians being killed, uh, particularly by the Israeli tanks targeting them. Uh, the Al Jazeera reported the, uh, the attacks on the civilian vehicles, uh, uh, despite it, it being clearly identified as such. Uh, apart from that, there is a, a major uh, uh, concern emerging uh, about the fate of the Al-Quds hospital inside the occupied uh, uh, Gaza, uh, where around 14,000 uh, Palestinians, both those who are injured and the other people who are basically taking shelter in it, are uh, on the, uh, in danger of being kind of attacked. There have been uh, bombings uh, in and around the hospital uh, uh, in the last 24 hours, uh, which has led to kind of uh, severe damages uh, in and around it. And Israel has repeatedly warned the asking people, uh, the injured uh, and their relatives, uh, entire hospital staff, in fact, to move out uh, of that uh, hospital, which basically uh, both the uh, uh, the authorities which are running the hospital and the uh, 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 other uh, human rights organizations have claimed is not possible to evacuate all those people uh, uh, now. This will basically endanger, endanger more lives. So uh, uh, those things are happening in and around Gaza. Meanwhile, uh, the, the Israeli uh, relentless bombing has continued uh, all across the Gaza Strip, uh, leading to uh, scores of more Palestinians dying. As per the latest figure, more than 8,100 Palestinians, the latest figure which says, have been killed. 
uh, and it seems that uh, Israel does not have any uh, uh, a kind of uh, uh, thinking or thought about uh, kind of stopping or, or implementing uh, the the demand which was which which have been made by different uh, sections of the world community to have kind of some kind of humanitarian uh, ceasefire at there. So uh, this is about Gaza Strip, of course. Uh, the, uh, on the other side, there is a uh, uh, heavy Israeli raid going on uh, on the Jenin refugee camp, which has been repeatedly targeted. And uh, on, on Monday morning, around uh, four people, uh, poor Palestinians were killed. Uh, another uh, couple of Palestinians were injured. And there have been reports of other uh, uh, kind of uh, attacks in different other parts of the occupied West Bank. So if we see, uh, it seems that we are repeating what happened uh, uh, on, on the last day. And every day it is kind of a similar story. Uh, only thing that the number of Palestinians being killed is increasing every day. And the humanitarian situation on the ground in Gaza is becoming worse and worse. Uh, uh, there were reports that uh, uh, the people desperate uh, without food and medicine basically barged in inside an UNRWA facility to get kind of uh, get uh, some kind of access to food. Uh, and, and that basically uh, shows the, the level of desperation which people are in in the Gaza Strip, uh, where millions all, uh, are basically on the walls of, uh, you can say, uh, apart from being uh, 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 killed by the uh, Israeli forces, also uh, killed by hunger and lack of medicine, lack of water, and so on and so forth. So number of trucks which are basically moving in uh, the humanitarian aid, whatever, is very limited uh, so far. Uh, since it started last week, uh, only 100 trucks, uh, 113 trucks have moved inside uh, uh, the besieged territory, and that is not enough uh, for more than 2 million people uh, living inside Gaza. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, fair enough. Uh, Abdul, and maybe we can take a minute to kind of talk about, because there have been mentions about, uh, you know, the, the, the telecom blockade uh, or shut off, um, the, the number of journalists that have been killed and, and the journalists that are operating in the region, what kind of conditions they operate in, right? On either side, yeah. on, it's either only those who are sort of secured by uh, security forces by by the Israeli military, uh, or those who are going at it with without any uh, sort of insurance or assurance even that they will be able to uh, do the job that they're doing, and and that becomes uh, extremely important because all of the conditions that you were talking about are what militaries describe as force multipliers. That's the entire exactly. philosophy. Uh, behind this kind of offensive. So if you can just elaborate on that bit and then we can come back to what is happening on the diplomatic front maybe to conclude. Well, uh, Israel has, uh, if you see, Israeli armed forces have not bothered about kind of uh, observing the minimum uh, uh, laws related to uh, uh, war in the international law, which basically uh, talks about protecting civilians, protecting all kinds of non-combatants, including the journalists uh, uh, and the health workers, by the way. The, the most, uh, if you see the number of Palestinians, uh, sorry, number of journalists killed and number of health workers killed, if you club them together, they are uh, uh, quite a big number. That is quite a big number. And that indicates that the uh, uh, complete uh, lack of any concern uh, shown by the Israelis when it comes to targeting them. As you rightly pointed out, this is deliberate. Uh, this uh, uh, many people have uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, indicated that uh, have underlined that that this particular attempt to kind of target journalists, tar target the health workers, target the aid workers who are there on the field, uh, whether it is from the UN uh, bodies or the local uh, uh, human rights groups or the NGOs operating, trying to do something. All of them have been repeatedly attacked, despite being uh, clearly uh, identified, wearing the marks for identification. And that seems, seems to be very deliberate. Uh, and, and this basically has created, uh, uh, as you rightly pointed out about the uh, uh, internet uh, shutdown or the telecommunication being uh, blocked. Now, there are, there are reports that there has been partial restoration of uh, internet and telecommunication inside uh, the Gaza territory. 
but uh, uh, for almost 36 hour israelis deliberately uh, kind of uh, cut the gaza off from the rest of the world all of this is basically a part of their uh, uh, war strategy uh, whatever it is called uh, 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 by them basically to kind of create uh, uh, a situation where uh, um, a panic uh, is instilled among the people uh, there to kind of force them to move out and even then by the way that is another thing which basically uh, uh, if you go by the common sense cannot explain asking people uh, scaring them to move out of their uh, 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 houses mm -hmm. their residential blocks homes and other places and but when they are moving out attacking uh, them in fact yeah. today uh, sorry on monday uh, morning there were reports that uh, a large number of uh, vehicles who were basically carrying out the people who were trying to move out because of the ground offensive in the northern uh, 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 gaza uh, northern gaza those vehicles were bombarded by the israeli uh, uh, war planes so uh, this particular strategy whatever if we call it is beyond anyone anyone's comprehension and there is no other way to describe it but a deliberate attempt to a kind of massacre to kind of uh, commit genocide on the ground in Gaza. Yeah, and do, do it behind as much of a veil uh, as possible at, at the same time, uh, of course, Abdul. And, and like we were saying the last time as well, when we spoke on this subject, that it also hampers the ability of whatever little relief effort there is exactly. to be coordinated. I mean, I think everyone can appreciate and relate to how important a thing like uh, maps are now that we have smartphones and the internet and how important coordination is uh, on that front. So even uh, there at every level, there, there is an impact. But but uh, what you were pointing out brings us very nicely into the bit about what's happening on the diplomatic front, Abdul. And we can take a couple of minutes to just focus on that. Uh, US Vice President uh, Kamala Harris uh, saying that uh, the, the United States isn't telling necessarily or Israel what to do, uh, but nobody seems to be. Uh, and how is it that still the level of impunity with which uh, they are operating is being allowed to progress on the diplomatic front? Well, uh, as we are discussing, uh, there is going to be a dis another discussion, uh, uh, emergency meeting by the United Nations Security Council. Uh, and kind of discussing another round of uh, resolutions, this time called by the UAE. Uh, uh, while we are saying that there, there can be a resolution uh, by the Security Council, even if US uh, uh, agrees with it, US has not agreed so far. And despite the claims made by Kamala Harris, OK, there are no US personals in the uh, occupied territories or in Israel, but there are US weapons on the ground. And there is a US diplomatic uh, support which basically provides Israel immunity, uh, impunity. If you see uh, uh, what happened uh, to the resolution adopted by the UN General Assembly on Friday, uh, nobody is talking about it. Uh, more than 120 countries voting in favor of it, um, say asking the Israel to asking Israel to stop, uh, kind of uh, stop for humanitarian uh, relief, uh, stop its war uh, on Gaza for humanitarian relief has not even um, bothered uh, anyone to kind of ask Israel to implement it. So uh, it, this, this is happening primarily because there are strong uh, international uh, backers uh, for this, uh, uh, for Israel, which basically ensure that even if the entire world turns against you, and, uh, uh, and we are not talking about the popular uh, uprisings which are happening all across the world uh, in support of the Palestine against the Israeli aggressions against the Israeli genocide we are talking about the governments which have their own diplomatic and uh, political concerns to calculate before they take a decision on uh, such resolution even then uh, 120 countries agreed uh, and voted demanding uh, uh, the ceasefire nothing happened and so we can debate and, and discuss. And it's not the first that, revolution either of them. Of course, uh, if we go, if we take the history of Palestine, uh, this can be the hundred or more than hundred, uh, hundred, uh, hundreds of the resolutions which have been adopted both by the United Nations Security Council and the General Assembly 
none of them have been implemented and each time israel's position has remained the same that uh, is uh, un has lost its legitimacy if it has lost legitimacy why you are a member of it one should ask but of course there is no point uh, talking all those things uh, the the, uh, the, uh, the central uh, argument remains central point remains that israel does not care uh, as long as uh, there is a uh, strong uh, un permanent uh, uh, members uh, which basically are behind it completely without any uh, uh, second consideration uh, a kind of uh, uh, thinking about backing whatever israel is doing and so israel can do whatever it wants to do without any concern uh, uh, and thinking about the repercussions and that's exactly what has happened this time again and i'm i'm not sure whether the, if there is even agrees to uh, pass uh, even security council agrees to pass a resolution tomorrow whether israel will uh, 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 follow it whether it will be asked to implement it uh, mm. uh, so it's complete uh, uh, on, on diplomatic front at least there is uh, there seems to be no hope at this moment right uh, and in in the same uh, sort of press statement or, or interview that uh, we were talking about earlier uh, there is the reiteration just 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 to remind that uh, israel is receiving diplomatic military and other kinds of all kinds of backing exactly. uh, from the united states uh, yeah so we we'll leave it there thanks very much abdul uh, for for joining us today i know it's it's a extremely challenging uh, situation even to report on from far away uh, because like you're saying uh, the, the the movement uh, and the action is so little from the outside world that that it it, it becomes uh, much more of the same and and it's difficult to come up with words in which to describe exactly what's going on but uh, thanks always for uh, giving us your time we'll move on to taiwan where uh, there's an election upcoming like i was saying there's some big elections upcoming in 2024 that will uh, also of course have an impact on how uh, the world that is currently in conflict will, will uh, develop will grow and will uh, sort of try to get out of some of these or not try to get further maybe uh, entangled in them but uh, this week the two main opposition parties have announced intentions to form a coalition uh, the incumbent of course uh, president is uh, as far as i know if I'm, i might be wrong here but ineligible to stand personally but anish is with us and has all of the details and uh, the information on what's going on and 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 why also this is important uh, perhaps at a slightly wider level as of now uh, anish first uh, the news update of course what what how what will this, this coalition look like and what sort of impact is it likely to have on the upcoming elections so from what we understand right now uh, the upcoming coalition would be more or less uh, something that they have fixed for uh, the legislative yuan election uh, which is the uh, the major legislature the national legislature of uh, what they call the republic of china uh, so there might be some level of uh, arrangements because they have a sort of uh, mixed member proportional voting system and so you have uh, you know a certain set of party lists so if these two can actually come together to pool their uh, votes uh, for the party that have in the party list that will be significant uh on the other hand uh, there might be constituencies uh, and that is not and so what we need to understand is that it's not very common uh in a place like taiwan or you know in most uh, electoral democracies for uh, them to have a sort of seat sharing agreements um uh, on a national level and this is something that is very true for taiwan as well and so then the constituency seats we do not know how they're going to share or uh, you know create an arrangement that can actually work for both of them uh considering especially the fact that uh, the two parties of the two parties the kovintan has uh, presented itself as you know the leading opposition front and it has always it will always uh, try to uh, present itself as the you know the major alliance partner if uh, a coalition or an arrangement comes together uh on the other hand uh, the tpp which is trying to present itself a, uh, you know in a very national manner has a very popular presidential candidate uh kuvenje and he is somebody who's leading over the kuvintang ca presidential candidate as well 
And so we have to wait and see how much uh, this kind of arrangement is going to work. But obviously, coming together, if it's a you know it's simple arithmetics, uh, the two parties together combined can actually take on uh, the ruling Democratic People's Party. Uh, and you know, obviously, uh, because both of them actually share more or less the same set of constituency uh, in the sense that the people who vote for the two of them have very similar ideas and ideologies and uh, you know well, their understanding of what they want uh, their country uh, to be uh, in the short and even long term uh, unlike the dpp which uh, presents itself as a sort of uh, you know uh, a very soft has a soft corner for um, you know the taiwan secessionist movement or what it's, uh, what calls itself as the independence movement uh, and a certain set of uh, you know economically uh, liberal uh, policies that kind of align with the US and who actually uh, have a more uh, uh, confrontational po policy against China uh, when it comes to these two other opposition parties and have pretty much been the reason why there has been significant tensions in the region because they have allowed for the US to, uh, you know, to uh, exploit that and become a major uh, political power in this conflict that exists between these two entities. Yeah, um, Anish, we, we've talked before about visits that have been happening on, on both sides and how they've uh, at some times inflamed and at other times also uh, kind of worked towards creating a political balance, at least domestically within Taiwan. Uh, so, so how do you balance the factors? What's happening? The outside influences, and and, and uh, what's going on within Taiwan? How do you balance these two out when we look at it from as, well as outsiders as we are? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question because uh, there is always this tendency to, and you know, uh, even a temptation to speak of uh, countries like Taiwan uh, in just foreign policy terms because a lot of their domestic politics is definitely informed by domestic issues. And the fact that the ruling DPP did very badly in the local elections recently that happened last year uh, and was routed, uh, you know, in even in places where it held otherwise a significant hold or control uh, shows that it is primarily because of domestic policies that people are looking at the party and the government as incapable of uh, dealing with the present set of crisis that the country is facing, uh, not uh, least of which is the cost of living crisis, but also the fact that many uh, many of them do not identify uh, with the kind of you know Taiwanese secessionism or Taiwanese nationalism uh, that the DPP kind of encourages, even if it doesn't uh, say it out loud, it definitely encourages and emboldens them in many ways and that is something that most people in taiwan who identify as chinese uh, because they definitely their country is still called china uh, whatever uh, manner or form it exists in and have a closer affinity with the mainland than you know anywhere else in the world uh, in many ways they do not uh, align with that ideology uh, that the ruling party kind of uh, encourages very often at the cost of uh, relations with china so obviously, the foreign policy part, especially relations with China, has and will always be a major part of any election that comes up in Taiwan. But at the same time, we need to remember there are significant set of domestic issues that uh, the ruling party has failed to deliver it. Uh, and that is primarily the reason why you see uh, their uh, you know, popularity has also dipped compared to the previous elections in 2020. Uh, Tsai Ing-wei, when she stood for re-election, she actually polled uh, in opinion polls uh, upwards of 40 or 45 percent, and she eventually received some 50, 52 percent votes. That is not something that can be expected in this round of elections, no matter how they uh, present themselves as. And you can see that sort of warmongering also happening at some level um, by the ruling party because they are provoking, they are actually expanding military presence for the U.S. in the region and also trying to rope in the U.S. and maybe other countries like Japan uh, into this conflict uh, to uh, and stoking certain kind of, you know, very reactionary nationalistic tendencies. Uh, 
exactly and that is something that uh, reeks of desperation obviously from the ruling party so this coming together of uh, two parties that have very similar uh, ideas when it comes to their relations with china is significant uh, because they it's not that they want china, taiwan to merge with china uh, yeah. uh, as yeah. mainland china wants but they do believe that having a more uh, uh, open dialogue and you know more open relations with the mainland is far more beneficial to the taiwanese people than uh, you know having a confrontational position and even you know uh, being a flashpoint for a future possible war uh, and that is something that a large number of people in taiwan also share a, a good uh, point to think on also for the two larger uh, at least in terms of number of voting people and population size uh, other elections have been mentioned in both india and the united states where we see uh, you know similar trends similar sentiments being stoked similar kind of positions being taken thanks very much arish for that uh, i was supposed to keep it short and but we are still running out of time and we still have anna with us so we're going to jump to her very quickly in the united kingdom uh, more people are spending money on private healthcare and this is making worse uh, the issues faced by the national health service which uh, a majority of britons have lauded as the single most thing they are proud of as being british uh, and uh, it, 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 the, the sort of dichotomy cannot be more clear uh, but anyway explain it to us well exactly uh, what's happening now in uh, in the nhs in the uk uh, is what people have been warning about since the beginning of you know of, of this kind of informal dismantling if we can call it of the nhs so by introducing the private sector by strengthening the role of the private sector uh, in the uk and so you know the first uh, symptom of this that we are seeing is that waiting lists in the nhs are soaring so literally uh, in a in a um, just in, in a couple of years so uh, since uh, in 2019, there were uh, a little over 4.5 million people on waiting lists. That number is now 7.7 .7 million. So in September 2023, uh, it's an enormous an am amount of people. And of course, people are looking for ways to avoid the waiting, waiting lists, which are uh, which essentially mean that you cannot access the healthcare that you need at the time that you need it. In some cases, the uh, the waiting times are so long, uh, a year or so. That it essentially means, you know, that uh, by the time that you reach a doctor, uh, there might be no more help. Uh, the condition might have gone so so much worse that you will need uh, more treatment. You will need more, more expensive treatment, and so on, and so uh, so on, and so on. So essentially, what we're seeing is an increase in both um, private consultations when it comes to treatments, but also when it comes to diagnostics. And when we talk about treatments, it's not about uh, it's not all about, you know, the extra treatments that one might think of. So the things that are elective, for example, but they're ba very basic things. So people in the private sector, they're getting eye surgery, uh, they're getting treatment for chronic back pain, mm, they're, they're getting hip replacements. Uh, so all of these things are very basic. Uh, it, it's something that aff uh, affects many, many people. Uh, and yet in the private sector, it can cost a lot of money. So, you know, for uh, for some of these procedures, we're talking about 10 to 15,000 pounds, uh, which is not something that people in the UK can afford right now as the cost of living uh, is soaring. And uh, as, as, as a matter of fact, most people are reporting that they now have no savings at all. So at the same time as this is happening, uh, the government is not... Uh, is not actually tackling the issues that it's seeing uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, in contrast, what Rishi Sunak's government is doing uh, is siding even more with the private sector. So we have had reports and information coming in that the, the most recent plans that the government introduced included also um, establishing and uh, launching independent, so-called independent, uh, in practice, private health centers uh, that... Um, that essentially replace the role of the NHS. And what this kind of approach is also doing, it's also um, expanding the reliance on the NHS on the private sector. Uh, so essentially it's, um, it's inter interlinking the two uh, so much that it's uh, at times very difficult to see, uh, to see what's going on. 
Um, but the things that we do know that uh, because of the approach that the current government has been taking and the previous governments have been taking is that uh, first thing, you know, we have seen uh, working conditions plummet. So they're nowhere to be seen. Health workers have been on strikes repeatedly over the past year. Uh, they have demanded better working conditions, better salaries, more employment. Uh, the government has taken a very problematic approach to this. Uh, avoiding any meaningful co conversation with the trade unions, with the health workers, uh, with other representations. Uh, and what this has caused uh, is not only um, not, yeah, not only um, a worsening of the conditions in the NHS, but uh, to a growing number of health workers leaving the NHS for the private sector. So you already yeah. have a shortage of health workers in the NHS. And now that's being made even worse because people are essentially saying, well, the private sector has better working conditions. I might just well might just as well work there. Uh, the second thing that we really need to point out is that what we're seeing now is the forming of a two-tier system in the UK. Uh, if the situation persists, it means that people will be, uh, the people who cannot pay will be forced to stay in the NHS. Uh, which will still continue to struggle with long waiting uh, waiting times, but it will also get defunded and it will not be able to keep track of all the needs that people have. It will not have enough money to invest in, in the equipment that it's needed. Uh, it won't have the money to pay the, uh, the, pay the health workers as, uh, as it should. Uh, at the same time, the people who can pay, of course, will go to the private sector and that's uh, going to make the private uh, sector happy, but not, not more than that. Uh, and so final point on this is that essentially uh, it also needs to be taken into account that the private sector is not uh, is not taking up all the roles of the NHS. So it's not willing to take up the procedures which are not profitable, which are very, very rare. For example, if you have a rare disease, you will probably not be able to, uh, to find help for that in the private sector because it's not profitable. They're not going to invest. Uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds in equipment, uh, in the education of health workers uh, to help a couple of people. A public health system like the NHS will do that. And also in doing that, push the bounds of research uh, and development for future so that when those rare diseases become less rare, uh, more people have access to it. Uh, thank you very much, Anna. I, I realize, I mean, we can talk again uh, on, on this forever and ever. As always, we've gone over time. Uh, but what I did ask Anna, Anna do was to kind of weave together a quite complex web of how things work and what these kind of policies have consistently done to public health systems uh, over the course of several decades, actually. And so it will take, like uh, she was pointing out, a consistent effort uh, to reverse some of that and uh, and and, a, and, a, and great political will uh, to begin with. Uh, with that, we bring another overtime episode of Daily Debrief to a close. Uh, from myself and everyone here, thanks very much for watching. We will ask you, before we leave anyway, to go to our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Until then, goodbye.